uh, 11 o'clock, and we're rolling. All right, this is a home interview, Norwich, New York. It is the 17th of May, 2006, 11 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My full name is Donald S. McDowell. Uh, my birthday it is August 6, 1925, and I was born at St. Joseph's Hospital in Syracuse. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, high school graduate, right. honor student. Then. Okay. Do you remember uh, where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was up on West Hill with my friend. Uh, we used to build shacks and roam around up there. And we came down late in the afternoon, and of course my folks were listening to the radio, and that's when we heard. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction? Do you recall? I guess it was one of shock and surprise. Mm -hmm. Although from the news we knew that things were coming. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted, uh, graduated in June and enlisted in July. Um, why did you, you selected the Army? Why did you select the Army? Well, my eyesight isn't the world's best and I was pretty sure that I could get in the Army. Plus the fact that while I was in high school I took the ASTP exam. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when did you enlist? I know you said July. July of what year? Oh, 1943. Okay. Um, where did you go for your induction? Fort Dix, New Jersey. Okay. Basic training? Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay. Um, I, I was trained as an infantry. That's infantry basic. Okay. That it's important. <laughs> How long were you there? Approximately. Probably 16 weeks, 16, 18 weeks. Okay. Um, being, this is probably your first time away from home? Basically my first time alone away from mm -hmm. home, yes. What was that like? How did you feel? You... Oh, a little scared, but I, I took the train from Binghamton down to Fort Dix by myself and I had no buddies with me. I was all by myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where did you go after your infantry training at uh, Benning? Then I went to Camp McCain in Granada, Mississippi with the 94th Infantry Division. How long were you there for? Weeks. Uh, let me explain that uh, at the end of my basic training, the Army in their great wisdom decided to bust up the 150 students they had for the ASTP program. Mm -hmm. And they saved, I think, about 30000 for the rest went in the Army. And the most pitiful sight was the poor guys that enlisted in the Air Corps, because I don't think the Air Force had their own group at that point. And these guys had parade drill, period. Mm -hmm. And I had 12 weeks of infantry training plus an additional four weeks when they decided what to do with me. Then I went to the, the uh, 94th Division. I was there maybe a month. And then I got transferred to Camp Bowie down in Brownwood, Texas with the 292nd Field Artillery Observation Battalion. And it was activated, the 292nd was activated in February, well, where are we now? We must be in 44. 44. Uh, one of 35 that participated in World War II. Now you had training as a forward observer? No, sir. Okay. The only training I had was a topical graphic, topographical surveyor at Fort Dix. No, I'm sorry, Fort Fort Sill 
by uh, Coach and Giodetti personnel. So you were never given forward observer training? I was not a forward observer. Oh, well, what were you then? What was your I was a then? member of the survey team of what was commonly known as flash and sound. Could you explain that? Uh, I, we, as I said before, we were 450 people and each each battalion, not battalion, each company was divided into a headquarters and an A battery and a B battery. Headquarters uh, interpreted our results. The A battery and B battery duties were the same except when we got to Europe we, we didn't see each other every day. I mean it might be a week or two before mm -hmm. we and I, I really didn't know very many any other groups. Uh, what we did, this, the flash people had good, good telescopes mounted on an asthma base, 360 degree asthma, and they would set up on high points. And it would be as, see I wasn't in there, but I, I'm, I'm guessing somewhere between four and five units. And they, they could see each other, so they were located on a map. And when they saw a gun flash, we were all, everybody was hooked up with a telephone, so they, if, if it was base number one, they said, I, I've got a flash at 180 degrees, so everybody knew where that was, so they turned their telescopes over, and if they picked up at least three flashes in the same spot, then this went into head, our headquarter battery, who then called Corps, Corps Artillery, and they fired a battalion of, of guns. So when we gave them a target, they fired a minimum of four guns. Mm -hmm. Now sound consisted of six microphones, very sensitive microphones that we tested by passing a hat over. You just wave. We sunk them in the ground two sound seconds apart in a straight line. And that's where the surveying come in because we had to survey out through the fields, hacking down brush and whatever to lay this straight base. And once that was in, <clears throat> again hooked up by telephone, there was a forward observation post and when they heard a gun go off, they turned on the equipment. And the microphones picked up the, the sound of the, the gun. This went back to headquarters and they had what I would now call a, a, a sort of a, a computer, which, so, this this showed uh, the waves. They took the asymptote of that, plotted that, and this gave them six a, a five ray point out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And again, we knew exactly where that point was. And again, they fired their f at least four guns. Uh, we were credited with knocking off fifty six guns at Swineford, which was a roller bearing. Mm -hmm village. And the next day they <laughs> they wheeled in another 18 88s. We picked those up, gave them the thing, and there was a little dissension in, in the artillery, but they were told, fire, these guys haven't made a mistake. So we got another 18. Mm -hmm. and, and then when we weren't doing this, and we could put one of these in in a, in a in a couple of days depending on the terrain and depending on our bugaboo was uh, landmines. Not the, uh, not the big teller mines for the tanks but the little personnel mines. Mm -hmm. And we lost a couple of guys uh, because they wandered off the road and got stupid. Uh, but once we got everything 
once we got the base in, then we took control to the artillery. We remember now we weren't at the front lines and we weren't at the back line, at, at the rear echelon. We were somewhere in between. And quite often, I remember in one particular place, uh, the uh, we had 105s next to us. And they moved out, and the 155s came in, and they were next to us. <laughs> and I was in a cobblestone, we were living in a cobblestone building at that point. When the 240s come in behind us, I went under the truck. I figured that cobblestone wasn't going to last. It did, but that's all right. I, I had a good night's sleep. So you were basically really different than a forward observer then. You, Absolutely. You worked mm -hmm. basically on the flash and then the sound. Yes. Did you ever have problems with the equipment that you had? Uh, it must have been very sophisticated for the time. We had 20-second girly transits, so if we had a downtime, we recalibrated the transits. It, it, this is surveying because we taped, we taped everything, and I forgot. I think we were off a yard, or a foot in a yard, something like this. Our accuracy was pretty good, so we could we could cut an angle. Um, within 10 seconds, 10, 10 minutes, 10 seconds. So we're pretty accurate and, and the maps were good. If we, we were off maps, there were plenty of church, church steeples around we could triangulate and locate where we were. Do you ever have much problem, many problems with the equipment that you were using? <laughs> the telephones weren't not the telephones, the radios weren't much good. Mm -hmm. The telephones were all were okay because we were all hooked up by wire mm -hmm. because we had a communications group and those poor guys had to lay all this wire. And that was real fun until the tankers came away mm -hmm. and decided to turn around on them. And now we, one of the scariest times I had, I was substituting for somebody out on the forward base and the phone went out which meant that I had no, we had no contact. Well, I was the newcomer, and there were, I was the third man. So the other two guys went back to trace the wire. And of course, night was coming on, so I sort of spent the night alone out there overlooking the Tsar River. Did you, uh, what kind of weapons did you carry? 30 caliber carbine, mm -hmm. and we had we had in the battery, we probably had uh, a half a dozen 50 caliber machine guns, period. Did you carry grenades also? I did. We weren't issued grenades, but they were easy enough to find. Mm -hmm. And I collected an awful lot of, well, we had an M1, and then I collected some German arms. Mm -hmm. Well, as they all did. I. I didn't have a pistol, but I had a burp gun and a machine gun, mm -hmm. stowed away in the truck. And my particular group, we had a trailer. We found a trailer so that we had extra gas in the trailer. That was a bugaboo. You, you run out of gas. Yeah. And the Red Wild Express didn't, we didn't have priority on the gas. That was the problem. So we had our own. Now, uh, you made a comment here. What, who do you think? Do you think the Germans had superior optics to... Yes, they did. Now, did they have similar setups? Yes. Mm -hmm. I reviewed some of my information. <clears throat> and uh, all of this started with the French. The French started the flash in World War One. The British picked it up. And somewhere along the line, they got some microphones, so some microphones came. So when World War II came, uh, the, the Army started collecting people to build this 
to organize this this kind of an outfit. Mm -hmm. And they ended up with with 35 in the whole in the, in the whole world, world global. And there were only five of us in Europe. And we got there late. So you had five in your team? That we, had, we had two crews in our batteries, so we had five, two, well, let's see, we have a transit man, a re, two, re, two a recorder, two uh, computers, uh, four rodmen, and me. Mm -hmm. I was I was sort of everything. I wasn't the leader, but I ended up, because of my eyes, I couldn't run the transit as quickly as a couple of the other fellows, but I could set it up, I could direct, I could direct the tapers. We had two taper teams, that's two men. Mm -hmm. We taped every, every yard. Now what were the computers like that you were using? Uh, the how, how large were, were they or how the small were they? They were books. Mm -hmm. They were math tables because everything was coming in as, as a logarithm. Now did you uh, have a strong math background from school or did you? Yeah, I took all the math they had in high school. Mm -hmm. So that definitely helped you? Yeah, which went through plane geometry, algebra, spherical algebra, solid geometry, in fact, in the last half year was, I think we were into intervals. Mm -hmm. So I had a strong base. Now your officers, uh, were they West Pointers or? Uh... The Colonel was a West Pointer mm -hmm. and, and very, very into the FOB information. Mm -hmm. In fact, he died about a year ago and they buried him at uh, uh, West Point. Most un <laughs> unsoldier-like unsold un officer you've ever seen. And he was, uh, then we had captains for each battery and a lieutenant for each, each individual, each separate group in a, in a battery. Mm -hmm. Didn't see much of the officers up there, but although our lieutenant was pretty good. And the company, the battery consisted of a bunch of young kids my age and draftees that were 38 or older. The last draftees we had. So they were the tapers, they were the truck drivers, they were the cooks. And the kids ran all the equipment. Um, th did you ever come under fire often or at all? <clears throat> never, as far as I can remember, never artillery fire. We were uh, under sniper fire over the Zarbuck and the river. We were on a knoll and the infantry was, they'd had a heck of a time there. The infantry was very, very scarce. But we were up there uh, trying to lay in a base. And there was a sniper at work up there and, and they caught him. I mean, he, he, was, he was hitting uh, first aid people. And they caught him. And a couple of the old infantry boys volunteered to take him back. And they were back within a half an hour he tried to escape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just wondering, I thought maybe the Germans would target you, your unit knowing... Uh, only, well... Uh, that it was, uh, well, let me finish the snipers. That was one instance. In another okay. instance, we were coming down, a, we were taping down a hill running some control and some German was across the the valley shooting at the road so you know once it hit the road you, you knew you were un, under trouble and we just called the infantry in and they finally was pretty drunk. The, the Germans were 
retreating so they knew every crossroad. They zeroed in on every crossroad. And uh, so when we came to a crossroad that wasn't clogged up with trees or anything, why we sent a car off, a truck off, every five minutes or something, staggered. So yeah, we got a few shells, but knowing this, why it was not a serious problem. Now, did this system just work in daylight, or did you have something that flash worked at night? Flash at night. Well, yes. sound travels at night too. Yes, right. So you could work the system at night also. Yes, and one thing the the, the army did for us towards the end is they did not fire they did not fire any artillery for three or four hours. So any any explosions we heard were for German. Did you ever have any casualties in your unit at all? Or? Not that I'm aware of. I think we had some that were well crippled with uh, landmines or okay, personnel. Yes, okay. mm -hmm. um, were there any officers or men that were in your unit that um, you remember more than others? That stand out? No, not really. Everybody loved the Colonel. Mm -hmm. So you basically followed the front in, into Germany? Yep. Yes. We were two or three miles behind, mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the Colonel was unsoldier like. Uh, what, what exactly did you mean by that? Well, his his uniform wasn't pressed. <laughs> it, you know, it, it hung over his boots. He didn't, he was, he didn't salute very efficiently. <laughs> he was one of the guys, basically. Basically, he was, yes. Mm -hmm. Some of the other officers were a little stuffy. Um, were there any incidences that made a greater impression on you, That any events that uh, made a great impression on you? Well, one in particular, I was at the Sound Outpost, and again, we were overlooking the Tsar River, and across the river was a, a wooded area plus a meadow, and on top was uh, the, 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 the quarry. Everybody was familiar with the quarry. And when I was only there a couple of days, but I was looking one day and a tank, an American tank, across the river came out of the woods. And I, well, you know, so I, now i got to start looking. Second tank come over and the Germans got them both. And I was telling this to a friend at work. He was in the third tank and didn't go out. I mean, it was just... <laughs> This this was a big meadow, the river, another meadow, and a hill, and these guys came out and got banged. And I can't remember. There were several killed, I know that. How do you think our artillery compared to the German 88s? Well, the German 88s were very maneuverable. They were, they were transported very quickly. Uh, and I think they had a pretty good range. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really have any yeah, I, I comparison except you. my brother-in-law fought in Italy in the artillery and he was impressed with the Germans. Mm -hmm. They seemed to be, they, you know, they were there. But they were, again, they were repeating so they, they knew, they had their targets. Mm -hmm. Now, with your unit being so specialized, um, did they pick individuals to go in your unit that maybe were a little better than we were the screened. average? We were screened. Uh, all, of, all of us, I think, had, or most of us had infantry training and were parked in an infantry division until they got the cadre together. 
and could accept us. Mm -hmm. So again, I went through basic training. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where did you see your last service uh, during the war? Do you go all the way through Germany? Yeah. Well, we were in in Germany VE Day. Mm -hmm. And uh, what part of Germany? Uh, well, we went through Nancy and and sort of ended up in Innsbruck. Okay. Which is, you know, I got done in Munich on a day pass or something. But what I didn't tell you was I the FOB only had two major catastrophes. In Tunisia, uh, they wiped out, I think, a whole battery. And in uh, Malmedy, which probably made the papers, uh, I think it was 135th, they knocked out a good portion there. This was Battle of the Bulge. They caught them, mm -hmm. lined them up, and machine gun them. Yeah. The lucky ones uh, crawled away and got out. But I, I don't think that our group ever considered it particularly dangerous. Were you ever aware of the concentration camps? Oh yeah, I went through Dachau. Mm -hmm. I didn't go th go in. It was there. Mm -hmm. I chose not to see it. Uh, and somebody else in our in the other, I think it was an headquarters company. Uh, they were guarding somewhere around Dachau, saw a couple of well-dressed men on the street, went to the MPs who ignored them. So they went to an officer and uh, they got the commander and his assistant. So we were, we were close to them, but that's the only, mm -hmm. that's the only one that we saw. Mm -hmm. What was it like when the end of the war was announced? Oh, everybody was glad except <clears throat> almost immediately it was announced that we we're going back to the states, re-equip and go to go to the east. Now, where were you, or do you, do you remember your reaction when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? At all? I, you know, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. How about the dropping of the atomic bombs? I, I yes, I do remember that. And strangely enough, our uh, our battalion was disbanded uh, the day before, or two days before the VE day or BJ day. Mm -hmm. It must have known that. The war was going to end soon, or the bomb was going to be dropped. I don't mm -hmm. don't really know, but what was your reaction when you heard heard about them? Good. I thought I was all done. I didn't have enough points to get out, but mm -hmm. uh, that was fine. Now, right. go ahead. Then I went went to Fort Bragg and got assigned as cadre to a training regiment. So you were there until you were discharged in 46? I, I, yeah, I got discharged from Kilmer. In fact, I was a <laughs> car commander. I just had a car load of discharge ease. I had all their paperwork and that was, I think it's Camp, Camp Kilmer. Do you ever get to see any USO shows? So I saw I saw one in uh, Camp McCain in Mississippi, and that's, that's all. I saw none in. Okay. Um, after you left the service, did you make use of the GI Bill? Yes, I did. In what ways? I went to college for four years. Do you think you would have been able to go to college if it wasn't for the GI Bill? I would have gone, yes. You would have gone anyway. Okay. 
How about the 5220 Club? Yeah, I was part of that for, for a bit. I, while I was still in service, I uh, wrote to RPI and uh, got accepted. And then I didn't get out as I thought I would. Uh, I didn't get out, and well, I forgot who when I did get out. But uh, must have been late spring, and so I had nothing to do for two or three months before school started. So I joined the 5220 club, and I, as a coach in genetics of Bear, they had no jobs for me for me locally. Mm -hmm. and one of my friends was a surgical nurse, so he couldn't find anything either. Do you uh, join the American Legion or any veterans organizations? Yeah, I'm a life member of the Legion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? We've had several reunions. Mm -hmm. The last one was a couple of years ago down in Carlisle where we went through the college and and uh, they were we're getting fewer and fewer. Mm -hmm. But there was no no one that you communicated with on a regular basis, or yeah, there was yeah there were, there were a few that I well one guy I always uh, communicated with, and then there were after the first reunion there were two or three others mm -hmm. plus. Uh, uh, the guy that was almost one, one level above me, and and I, when I was a corporal, he was a buck sergeant. When I was a buck sergeant, he was a staff sergeant. But I, I communicated with him, and and uh, believe it or not, he joined the South Carolina National Guard and quit as a brigadier general. Yeah. A little bit of political. <laughs> <laughs> in there, but so be it. I, I did not join the reserve. Mm -hmm. How do you think your time in the service uh, changed or maybe had an effect on your life? Well, it made my education a lot easier. I think it destroyed a little bit my eagerness I thought about that quite a bit. My eagerness, uh, when I graduated from high school, I wanted to learn everything. But the first thing I learned in the Army is that you could disappear and get away with it. I, at Fort Dix, I met an old guy and he says, there's no sense in staying in formation. We just stand here and listen. If your name gets called, you run out zipping up your pants. <laughs> <laughs> and during during basic training, geez, we had night hikes in the woods. This is kind of crazy, you know. We did it every week or two, or a couple times a week. This little guy from Boston, I guess. We we're talking about. I says, you know, what happens if we wander off and get lost? Let's try it. So we did. Just the two of us, we went to the edge of the woods knowing where they were coming out, joined up, and nobody knew the difference. <laughs> Find out how to work the system. Yeah, that's, I guess that's, that's it. Work the system. I had, I had tin cans of my pack when we should have had a full pack. And, and this guy and I did it once more. This time half the company, half the battery was behind us. And we sweat that one out, but joined up with them. No problem. <laughs> now you sent us this. If you could just hold it here and, and tell us where oh, and when, geez, look at that. where and when that was taken. Hmm. I don't know. Well, if you just hold it up and... Because I didn't focus. get a furlough. Uh, we were getting ready to go overseas, and I had to tell them I hadn't been home yet. Mm -hmm. That upset me a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, what, <coughs> what rank were you when you were discharged? Staff Sergeant. Acting First Sergeant.
Okay. Now you had other photographs uh, you wanted to show us, or other others you can look at. Sure. Oh, let's see. Well, there's something here I really wanted to show you. I got a map of where we went. Oh, that's it's over here. Well, you sent us a copy of that, this one? Yeah. Okay. Did I send you a list of where we'd been? No. Hmm. Oh, I got one of those too. Do you think you would have ever toured Europe if you hadn't been in the service? Have you? Well, I got a job and I'm a local boy and I got a job locally and uh, one of my customers was Rolls Royce over in Germany, oh, okay. right over in uh, England. England. I went to Fokker in the Netherlands. Uh, then I went to California a lot because mm -hmm. I did all the aerospace stuff. Anyway, there's my. If you could hold it, you know, like this, Wayne could focus on, on whatever. Well, if you wanted to show us that. Oh, yeah, geez. Bet you can't get them in focus. <laughs> yes, you <he> can. <laughs> yes, you <he> can. <laughs> I had to guard those, those things for two days. Which, on which side? Oh, the girls. Oh, the girls, okay. The girls. Now, who were they? They were Russian displaced persons, and we had them holed up in a monastery. And there was a, a stream that was fenced in, and they let some of the girls go down and, and bathe and such. Unfortunately, on the other side of the stream was a main road full of GIs. <laughs> Uh, these girls would come down and strip to their underwear. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Now, what happened to those girls? Do you know? I don't well, know. We were only there a couple of days. It was my duty, or my lot, I guess, to, to guard them. Uh, they were rambunctious and they were a real pain because what we did, we set up uh, machine guns. It was a big square building. We had a machine gun here and another one over here. And after a certain hour, if there was any movement, they fired a gun. So that kept them in. And I think that's the only way we could get them in. Mm -hmm. Now, did, did they, well, I don't know, did you know if they wanted to go back to the Soviet Union or? Well, from the did you ever... solicitations I got, they wanted out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they were from Estonia, Lithuania, mm -hmm. uh, at least the ones, the girls that came in. They were pretty girls, too. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for your interview. Yeah.